So, Tom, Marilyn will tell you it's 7 o'clock. She would tell me it's 7 o'clock, and I will assume that she told me. And uh, let us begin. Pardon. This is the June meeting of Inland Empire District 12 Speakers Bureau. And we intend to have a very special, uh, very special night. Suzanne, do you have a preference whether you speak now or at the end? You probably have more people here at the end, but I'll leave that up to you. You're muted. You're muted. Suzanne, I'm trying to read your lips. We should be able to do that by now after all this practice. <laughs> yeah, we're still thinking. Yes, I will save the punch for the ending. Thank you so much, Tom. Okay. You're all going to get punched later on, so get ready okay. for it. So, Okay. I think we are, as I said, we won't be doing much introduction. People will have to assume they learned something about you in your speech. We only, to get everybody in, 15, we had 16 last month. And we would have had 16. We lost uh, a couple and got one that I had forgotten. Somehow fell through the cracks. And, uh, well, we have 15 assigned speakers, assuming they all make it. And that should be quite a, a fun film packed <laughs> evening. And, again, it be accessible. Thanks to Rob Gunnerman, be accessible on YouTube in the future so you can re-access that. And so, without any further ado, we will begin with Speaker number one, speaker number one, who, by the way, I mentioned earlier, was the first time to sign, first one to sign up, so he gets number one. Wartime traumas and its effects, Ray Robles. Wartime traumas and its effects, Ray Robles. You're muted. Oh, Ray, you're muted, muted Ray. Ooh, that just docked myself 12 seconds. In 1920 and 21, two people provided a port of entry for this little one to come into this beautiful planet we call Earth. They themselves made their entry and exit via this little town in the Mojave Desert here in California. Bureau host, fellow Toastmasters, Ted and Connie, both grew up in this little town of Barstow. You know, the one on the way to Sin City, off the I-15. Their parents, both paternal and maternal grandparents themselves, were the cities, were from the cities of Chihuahua and Aguascalientes in the old heart of Mexico. Both my grandparents worked in the railroad industry, the up and coming boom industry at the time. And they eventually migrated to Barstow. And why not? After all, the Harvey House had just been built, a beautiful railroad hub where there were this beautiful, gorgeous cafe, lodging, and maintenance facilities for folks coming into California and other states beyond. Well, to the point. Dad entered the Army Air Corps in 1942, and after being washed out as a P-38 pilot because his, his education, or lack thereof, caught up with him. So he ended up being a ground soldier instead. Not a big problem, and he was a participant to the invasion of Normandy. While he didn't talk much a whole lot about it, he ended up taking several rounds into his legs in that particular invasion. He ended up being in the foxhole for three days before he was finally rescued by medical personnel. He ended up going to, into a, a small make-do hospital there in France and eventually was shipped out to San Francisco to the Army Letterman Hospital, which to this day, of course, is shut down. Well, I can no longer say to this day, but years back, he actually feared thunder during rainstorms. Well, you know, it does rain in Southern California, right? Anyway, this impacted his suppressed memory of large incoming rounds on that cold beach prior to his nearly unavoidable fate. After being recovered by medical personnel, again, he ended up in the Southern California area. Not a bad deal because he, he actually grew up in Barstow as well as Connie, my mom. They dated for a while before he went to the service. When he got out, 
they eventually married. And they ended up going to Tehachapi, a small community, because he lived in Los Angeles for a while, but he had a difficult time with the uh, excessive amount of people. So shortly thereafter, they moved to Hatchby and I was born. Though we escaped any physical harm, in 1952, there was a massive earthquake in Tehachapi that destroyed our house. Now, fortunately, we weren't there at the time. We were visiting relatives in Los Angeles. But I think this was the first incident that triggered is what we know now as PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. At that particular time, we, there was not a name for it, but now of course we know it as PTSD. Obviously I can't speak to the thousands of other returning vets that survived, yet the study of those experiences and dealing with trauma can often lead to issues affecting not only themselves, but those around them as well. The tendency for many who have undergone these and other traumatic events who have not sought treatment to mask or deal with those events, they ended up going dealing with drugs, alcohol, countless other potential destructive type of activities, anything to mask the pain and avoid unintentionally the healing process. The way of dealing and healing is another speech in itself for another time, of course. <clears throat> Ultimately, dad's way of dealing was in a bottle, a Budweiser bottle. He would sometimes go with other vets to nearby bars and self-medicate, and he loved to rumble. Don't know why those guys love to fight, but that they did. He in particular loved to get into rumble tumble fist fights, sometimes coming home with a black eye. If he would leave his aggressions at these bars, all would have been okay, but he often brought them home with him and ended up drinking many a time throughout the weekends. My mom dealt with this for several years. She had friends from her school days that encouraged her to stay strong and hang in there or leave him. Divorce was not as common as it is today, of course, and yet she contemplated doing so anyway. Instead, she, come, she succumbed to leukemia at the age of 42, living, leaving my siblings and I to fend for ourselves, support each other, and of course, take care of each other. We did so. Our dad was there, of course, but he went through his grieving process and wasn't always there for us. Fortunately for myself, we did have our, my siblings and we took care of each other very, very well. Thank you very much. <clears throat> We've all encountered setbacks, some more than others. Implications often being more than we care to endure, yet it's up to us to make a decision that life happens for us and not to us. In every event, there is a purpose, a reason, or a lesson to be learned. We're all doing the best that we can. When we know better, we do better. And I beg, may we all strive to know better. Through the events my dad and countless others have gone through, I've learned the value of reaching out for help and the strength and endurance of forgiveness. Happy Father's Day, Dad. I love you. And as Bob Hope would say, thanks for the memories. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Very uh, thoughtful and sharing. I love the fact that we can do that in Toastmasters. We have the opportunity to share those deep feelings, and that's the reason for this meeting. Our second speaker will have some thoughts to share with us, I know, as he belongs to my home club, and I've known him for many, many years, and been in more than one club with him. Speaker number two, Bob Anderson, how important are fathers? How important are fathers? Bob Anderson. Just noted I was muted. My youngest grandson, when he was five years old, was just learning to play soccer. <clears throat> there were, everybody was on the field and in one particular play, some kid just about his size pushed him down on the ground and he started crying. 
He came out of the game and his mother gave him compassion. Oh, honey, are you feeling okay? He stopped crying pretty soon. And then his father came over and said, Abbott, that was a badge of courage. Get back in there and show them what you've got. Mothers are different than fathers. And it's not that we need two parents. It's that we need a mother and we need a father. And that kind of shows you the difference. And both are needed. Compassion is needed. But also, get back up in there. Don't give up. Fathers have been studied, and sometimes it has become fairly obvious that fathers have a tremendous impact on their kids. They can give them social competence. Their performance in school goes up. They can emotionally regulate themselves better, i.e., they don't have to get so angry. They know how to deal with those emotions. They actually have advanced language skills. If parents get along, if the mother and father gets along, then the child learns how to resolve conflict much easier. There's the obvious advantage of economic security when uh, there's a father in there working. Children need to be loved and accepted, and two parents do that. They're more confident. They're better at communication skills and higher intellectual functioning. The role of a dad can be summarized protector, educator, role model, friend, entertainer. What's wrong with kids having fun? Dads get a bad rap because they like to play with their kids. What's wrong with that? They like to play. Counselor trainer and marriage partner, if they can get along, they train the kid how to solve problems. I have a friend who I was talking to about this speech, and he told me what happened to him when his parents divorced when he was about 13 years old. He emotionally shut down. It caused him to become shy. He, he couldn't even talk to other kids, let alone to adults. And it took him a long time before he, he came out of that shyness. He said, thank God for Amway. It showed him if he was going to uh, make his goals, he was just going to have to bust out of it and, and make it happen. And that finally is what happened to help him get by that, that incident. One study reports children with fathers are 39% more likely to earn mostly A's in school. 45% are less likely to repeat a grade. 60% are less likely to be suspended or expelled from school. You're twice as likely to go to college and find stable unemployment after high school. 75% less likely to have a teen birth and 80% less likely to spend time in jail. The girls have a different reaction, but just as important, it's just a little different. Girls growing up without a father sometimes don't trust men. They have eating disorders. They're more likely to be the victim of physical and sexual abuse, always seeking affection and validation from some source because he didn't get it from her father. They feel more insecure and unable to cope with stress. And they have a negative body or self-image. More likely to turn to drugs and alcohol. Guys are too. Both guys and girls are more likely to turn to drugs and alcohol. More likely to engage in risky behavior like becoming pregnant or contracting a sexually transmitted disease. They don't know what to expect from men. And they damage their educational and occupational uh, possibilities. So let me tell you a story about my father. In my family, my father's parents came from Norway many years ago. My, father, my grandfather had a fifth grade education and my grandmother had a third grade education. He was born in Los Angeles and man, was he into education. 
just about everybody that came into our house. And basically, really, if it's a guy and he regret and he should have been college age, if he wasn't in college, he would buttonhole him and say, why aren't you in college? I don't think I would have had the guts to ask him if I had to go to college. But if I did, I know what the answer would be. In my family, it was just assumed that you were going to go to college. You didn't need to talk about it. The only question was where. And that gave me a lot of confidence to develop in my academic and occupational life. I went to college and I had more education after that too, but that started me on the road to thinking education was going to be very helpful. You may already know the importance of good fathers to kids today. So I have a suggestion for you. Think about a child, either a boy or a girl, you know, that doesn't have a positive dad in their lives. It could even be a new dad that needs help understanding what a dad is supposed to be. Could you arrange a positive dad experience for that kid? Maybe a fishing trip, maybe a sports event, a chess tournament, a ride in a Corvette, an ice cream cone to give that kid some dad input. That child will grow up and whether it's a boy or a girl, they need to know what a dad can be. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, Bob, with so much, so much special information. If I had been a better researcher, I would have included a whole lot of those things you brought up because I think they were so important for most people who don't maybe don't appreciate the value. Part of the reason for this actual event this evening is to learn the value of dads. Someone who obviously has a value in fathers because her title of her speech is My Three Fathers. Number speaker number three, Judy Van Arsdale. Judy Van Arsdale, my three fathers. Judy. Everyone has a father. Hello, Toastmasters and honored guests. Although I never met my father, I was lucky to have had one father and two dads. They all made tremendous impact on my life. Although I never met my dad, my father, my first father, he gave me curly hair that I grew to love and appreciate. But most importantly, he gave me a good start in life with healthy genes, a good mind, and healthy body. When I was about three years old, I began to wonder, where in the world is my father? With a picture of my father in my hand, I set out looking for him one day. I walked up and down the street, looking up at all the tall men that came my way and compared them with the picture in my hand. After a few hours, got hungry and thirsty, I decided I will complete my mission another day. The minute after I walked in, my jaws dropped. I looked in my hands. Where is the picture of my one and only father? And I realized I must have lost it on the way home or on the way walking there. I backtracked searching for that picture of my father and I never found it. Although I never found my father, nor the one and only picture I had of him. A few months later, I got a dad when my mom married. Now, he spoke perfect Mandarin. 
because he came from mainland China. I learned to speak perfect Mandarin from him. My mother was a Taiwanese, a native Taiwanese. So I became bilingual after he came into my life. And probably because of him, I excelled in schoolwork because they were all taught in Mandarin. And once or twice a year, he would take the whole family to go see movies. Those were special days that we look forward to. Now, one special fact about my father is, about my dad, my Amer Chinese dad, was that he went to the temple with my mom, but he also prayed with rosary in his hands because he told me he didn't want to miss any way of getting to heaven. Uh, when I was 12 years old, a second dad, I call him my American dad, came into my life when I was adopted by missionary family. He gave me a new lease on life when he performed appendectomy on me. After a long day at work, performing operations and seeing patients, and after dinner, it was a special time when he would teach me English and read me stories of those brave American Indians, such as Sitting Bull, Crazy Horse, Bigfoot, as well as Booker T. Washington. I grew up admiring those characters, wanting to be like them. Now, my American dad was definitely not an authoritarian, although he spoke with authority because he was well-educated. Nonviolence wasn't just the words. It was his way of being. One of his quotes that remained with me, with me to this day is, here lies Johnny J, who died defending his right away. I remember that every time I got behind the wheels, driving up and down those crazy California freeways. And that's probably one of the reasons I stayed alive. I never tried to defend my right away because of what my dad taught me. After coming back to America with my new family, my dad and I went hiking one day in the woods of Michigan. And he told me, now, Judy, this is cow country. Watch your steps. And guess what? Of course, I stepped into a cow pie. <laughs> now, although my dad came into my life late in life, he was the one who taught me English. When I was adopted, the only words I could say were hello and goodbye. But he patiently taught me how to pronounce those vowels, A-E-I-O-U, and sometimes Y, as well as those difficult words and resonance that I had to practice with him several times. He would open his mouth and tell me how to compose all the difficult phrases correctly, as well as with right emphasis on certain words. Now, although my father's, my, my one father and two dads are gone, they are in my heart forever. And I thank you to all my dads and father for being there. Back to you, Toastmaster. 
Thank you so much, Judy. I have to keep my self above and not to keep saying wonderful things to each speaker because I don't think we'll have time, but you added so much to this meeting, bringing us your cultural background and experiences that uh, many of us would not have had the chance to learn about. So thank you so much for that. Our next speaker is speaker number four, if I can get to that, speaker number four, also a member of one of the clubs I belong to, Reverend Ralph Rivers, and his title is Clayton, Clayton Ralph Rivers. Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters and welcome guests. It's been my credo in life to understand that no matter what you do, do it well. Do it with gusto, do it with pride. I think Martin Luther King said it best. He said, if it falls your lot to be a street sweeper, sweep streets as Raphael painted pictures, sweep streets as Michelangelo carved marble, sweep streets as Beethoven composed music or Shakespeare wrote poetry. By that measure, my father, Clayton Rivers, was a true artist. You see, he didn't have a lofty position. He was the chief custodian at Douglas Aircraft for 25 years. And he took such pride and had such passion for that job that you would think that he was a virtuoso. He was also a World War II Brit. Tom Brocko, Brocko said of that generation that it was the greatest generation. And it certainly was a great generation for me as epitomized by my dad. I remember one Saturday when I was young, he invited me to come down to his place of employment, McDonnell Douglas. And he opened the doors and I went to step into the hall and jumped back because it looked like the floors were burnished so black and the linoleum was, was glistening so that it looked like it was a long, dark hole that you could fall into. As he saw my reaction, he sheepishly said, oh, I came and polished that yesterday. He was a man that made you just understand that it was so important to lead your family, to, to be the type of person that not only your children could look up to, but they could emulate. I, I was very impressed by my dad and Clayton because he owned his own home. Now, let me tell you something. In those days, it was very unusual for African-American or as a colored, as we were called then, to have that distinction. And here's the greatest emphasis. He paid for it cash. I don't know how many of us now have grander homes built of marble and stories, but not many of us can retire a mortgage before we have one. And he, he always carried himself with great pride. If wherever he went, he was dressed to the nines. But yet he had the humble touch. He, he could walk with kings, but still keep the common touch. He told me a story one day that as he was in his custodian's office, the chairman of Douglas Aircraft had a habit of stopping by and chatting with him. And he would discuss more than the weather. He would discuss how the stock market was going and what the workers felt about working under these hard conditions that sometimes were 24 hours long. The president of McDonnell Douglas would stop and confer with my father. And like I said, he was always dressed and he cut such a dashing figure that, that as I talked to some of the people 
in his past. They would tell me some of the stories that had my mouth hanging open about how he was uh, gracious to everyone. He never met a man or a woman he didn't like. He, he had an outstanding wit. I remember one day we were riding in a car somewhere around El Segundo. And this was a while ago. And he looked over and he saw a farmer out there working in this field. And he said, that's a great man. I said, a great man, dad, do you know him? He said, no, but he's outstanding in this field. <laughs> I started to learn that my dad had a way of pulling your leg, but still giving you grains of wisdom. He, he was prophetic and thorough in teaching us the wiles and the ways of life. He used to look me in the eye sincerely and said, son, don't you ever forget that there is a God. Like I said, people that knew him <laughs> in his younger days always talked about his bon vivant ways, his, his, his dashing appearance and his ready wit. They would say to me, your father was a pistol. I guess that makes me a son of a God. I do know that the other day, Memorial Day, was the 25th year that I saluted his flag up over my mantle. And as I did, I took out his dog tags and I read Clayton Rivers, 384-01-642. You see, he's numbered with the greats. And that's simply because he was a great father and a greater American. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, Ralph. I think I heard most of this speech in a few Father's Day in the past <clears throat> ago. And I was so glad you said you would be able to repeat it tonight. It has so many good messages in there. And now speaker number five, Dan Schroff, success. Success, Daniel Schroff. Thank you. How do we define success and who is successful? I was asked this one night at a Toastmasters meeting when somebody asked, who is the most successful person you've ever met? And I had to think for a minute, I knew the answer, but I had to think for a minute, how do I evaluate success? Is success being rich, like uh, the Betos, the Trumps, uh, Elon Musk? I don't think you can measure success on money because the playing field isn't level. Is success being famous, movie star, rock star? Again, we're in an area where the playing field isn't level. So where does the playing field level out? It levels out at the beginning of the Declaration of Independence when it says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by the creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's about as level of a playing field as you can possibly get, which brought me to the person who I think is the most successful man I've ever known. That would be my father. My dad grabbed all of those, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and he never let go of them. For life, my dad lived. Most people say you only live once, which is false. You die once, you live every day. And my dad lived every day. Every morning he woke up and he faced the world as though he, it was his first day on earth. He was happy, eager to get going to work. He wanted to see what was in store for him that day. And at the end of the day, he came home and prayed before going to bed that it was his last day on earth. And if his God should take him that night, he's satisfied and he has no regrets. As far as liberty, my dad was born in 1919, way, way back. <laughs> and 
about 1937, he joined the military, mostly because his family's farm in Anaheim, they needed money. Times were still tough back then, and he joined. And he thought, mistakenly, that his term would be up on December 31st, 1941. However, on some little island out in the middle of the Pacific, that all changed in a heartbeat. So my dad knew that he was now in for the duration and he married this adorable little girl who looked like a grown up Shirley Temple. That was my mom, Ruth. And he married her in early 1942 before they shipped him out to China Burma India Theater where he spent another four years as a quartermaster in the US Army, finally getting out in not 1945, but in 1946, when they finally shipped him home. And he was a tech sergeant, five stripes. And when he got home, he knew, and this is going into the pursuit of happiness, by the way, but he did join the military because he knew that liberty isn't cheap. He knew that liberty has a cost and he was willing to pay that cost. But when he got out and he was uh, first offered jobs, a lot of places wanted to hire my dad. I mean, my dad was in the military for almost nine years as a quartermaster. He could literally take an engine apart blindfolded and put it back together. Might be missing a couple screws here and there, as we found out when my dad and I took our Corvair engine apart and put it back together. And I asked him, what are those? And he was like, oh, that's the crankshaft. But Aside from that, he could, you know, he was a little out of practice by then. But all these companies wanted him to come work for him. And at each company, when he went there, in his pursuit of happiness, the first thing he asked was, will I be able to bring my kids with me to work? And all but one said no. And the one that said yes was Home Oil Company in Anaheim, California. And that's where my dad went to work. Because my dad drove gasoline and diesel trucks out to all the farmers in Orange County. And back in the 50s and 60s, 70s, 80s, there were still a lot of farms out there. And my dad wanted a job where he could take his sons and daughter with him to work. Because in his pursuit of happiness, he remembered growing up on the farms. He remembered a lot of things that he wanted us to experience such as going out to a strawberry farm first thing in the morning when the strawberries are still covered in the morning dew, picking them and eating them right out there in the field. He also, during the late summer, we would go out to cornfields. My dad would walk out to a corn stalk and break off a couple of ears. He showed me how to husk a corn in no time flat. And we would eat the corn right there in the field, only warmed by the sun. And this corn did not need any kind of butter or salt or anything. If you've never tried corn on the cob without cooking it, give it a shot. It's worth, it's worth it. To this day, I don't eat cooked corn. But my dad wanted us to go out there into the fields with him with that same first day of life, curiosity, what are we doing? And he did that for 40 some years at that company. All me and all three of my siblings all got to go out with him on that truck. We all remember those as some of the best times of our life. We also all knew that when we were on the truck, every now and then we would think dad was talking to us, but he was actually sitting over there in the driver's seat and he was praying and he was having a day long conversation with God. He never stopped. It was a morning, noon and night thing. And that's probably what kept most of us sane was the calmness that he had in every situation because he knew who was in charge. So if you have a chance, try living each day like a child, going out for your first time ever into your city. Look for something you've never seen before. Take a picture of it. See if you can take 365 pictures of something that you've never seen in your city. Live each day like it's new. And when you do that, you can also end each day knowing that if it's your last, you have no regrets, Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, Daniel. I certainly didn't expect to learn about the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in a group of speeches about fathers, and yet it certainly makes a lot of sense. Our next speaker is Ryan Auden. 
And his title of his speech is Forgiveness is Key. Forgiveness is Key. Ryan Otten. I was hurt, angry, and bitter towards this person. I didn't know how I could ever forgive him. Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters and honored guests, has there ever been one person in your life that you've had a hard time forgiving? For years in my mind, I imagined myself locking this person in a cage and throwing away the key. He was supposed to be known for his love, his acceptance, and to be my protector, but I found such rejection from this person. I loved him and hated him at the same time. It was a mixture of emotions running so wild like a rushing wind. Have you ever experienced such emotions like this? I've been on a long journey of learning to forgive my father. My dad, he's no ordinary dad. He's a ale, ale. He's a Jamaican dad. Oh no, oh no. Oh no. Jamaican dads, they are very distinctly different than any other kind of dad out there. They are very blunt. They don't hold back the truth, man. They tell it how it is, man. Yeah, man. Jamaicans be crazy, truth tellers, man. Aha. Well, maybe not all Jamaican dads. Some are kind, some are gracious, but not so much my dad. I love my dad, I really do. But I, I could still remember at a very young age, ladies and gentlemen, my dad would come up to me and he would say, Ryan, man, you are a fat boy. You are a weird boy. You are lazy. And these words would just twirl around in my mind and make me feel so insecure. Have you ever experienced such words that just diminished your life? Words hurt, but what hurts more are those actions of rejection. I remember growing up with my mom and year after year, I would call my dad on the phone and I would say, dad, can, 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 I, please, can I please live with you? Oh, oh, please, I just wanna be with you. I wish he told me no, instead of beating around the bush. Years of bitterness were piling up like a bucket of mud ready to spill over. So at the age of 20, I had it. I said, dad, I don't like you. Get out of this place and never come back. When really, I just wanted to be held by the one that I love. But then came a turning point. A family friend named Pat, he came over that evening. And the thing about Pat is, you gotta meet him. He has all this love, all this wisdom, all this grace, all this truth that when you talk to Pat, your life is never the same. Pat invited me on a two month camping trip to Utah and we had a great time out there. But what really impacted me the most was this one conversation that we had. He said, Ryan, the reason why your dad has a hard time loving you is because his own father did not know how to show him love growing up. Ryan, I want you to live a successful, abundant life, but if you keep holding on to all that bitterness, you're not going to be able to experience it. You may think you're keeping your dad locked up in a cage in your mind, but really, you're the one who's locked up in that cage. I give you the key. The key to release yourself 
out of that cage. It's been seven years since Pat and I had that conversation. And I can finally say, I'm learning more and more each day to forgive my father. As I've embraced learning to forgive my dad, because it's not a one-time deal, forgiveness is a daily thing. But I've been able to live free. I've been able to, to breathe. I've been able to accept my dad for who he is, even if he never changes. With a lot of prayer and a lot of learning to love unconditionally, I've seen such a tremendous growth happen in my dad and I's relationship, ladies and gentlemen. And I love him so much. This past Thanksgiving, I got the opportunity to see my dad because I was not able to see him through this pandemic. He lives on the other side of the country. And we had such a great time together. He allowed me to sit on his lap. Imagine that, I'm 27, and he allowed me to sit on his lap for some reason. And he whispered in my ear saying, you know your daddy loves you. <laughs> 20 years later, even though it may be late, I'm thankful that God is answering my prayers. Fellow Toastmasters, honored guests, who is somebody that you, you may need to forgive? Everyone's story is different. But what I can say is, as I've learned to forgive my dad, the benefits, the consequences of forgiveness have reaped so well years later. I'm not saying that everyone will change. But what I can say is, your life can change. And I hope and pray that you have this kind of experience, like how I did with my dad, this past Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. I don't know, there's something wrong with this world. You're not supposed to be as old as I am learning so much from people so much younger. We will go on to somebody else who's younger. Anyway, <clears throat> go on to number speaker number seven. The apple can't change, Michael Olson. Michael Olson, the apple can't change. We all have sayings that we really don't like. Mine was, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Duh, we all learned about Newton's law of gravity in elementary school. And we, we tried it out and uh, did experiments by falling out of the apple tree and found out that was true. So it's not hard to believe that the apple doesn't fall far. But I've often wondered, but what, what if you pick an apple up and you throw it as far as you can? Or even better yet, put it in a potato gun and see how far you can shoot it. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, my fellow Toastmasters and friends. <clears throat> Pardon me. I'm going to show you a picture of my family, and you can see there is definitely a family resemblance between parents and children. So it's not hard to believe that people would say that the apple did not fall far from the tree. The thing is, some of you may have wanted to be like your fathers. Anybody wanted to be like your father? That was not me. I am a straight contrarian from the word go. I grew up in the mountains of Montana. The closest NFL team is over a thousand miles away. So I could pick any football team that I wanted to. Who did I pick? Well, my father was a fan of the San Francisco 49ers. 
So I became a Rams fan because they were their in-division rivals. When my father graduated from high school, he went to college. So I joined the military. And later, when I got out of the military and I decided to go to college, well, my father became a teacher. Actually, both my parents were teachers. And in a small town, that means everybody knows your parents and tells on you. So there was no way in the world I was going to become a teacher. So I went to school for business finance to do something completely different. And then they turned me into a business consultant. Isn't that a teacher? I think it is. So I, I finally got back out of the, the, the thing and my father decided he was gonna move on to something else other than teaching. He became a minister. And this was great. He moved down to California. And when I got out of the military, I decided I was going to help him because he had decided he didn't like California. He was going to move out. So I came down to California to help him move. Well, when he moved back to Montana, I moved to California. So every chance that I was getting, I was doing everything opposite what my father would do. But you can't change an apple even if you throw it or shoot it out of a cannon. Because eventually, I left California and moved to Colorado back to the mountains. Not only that, but what I'm doing for my business is to help people that have suffered from problems with addictions, with personal demons, in trying to help them overcome it. There is an awful lot that's similar between doing that and being a minister and helping people deal with their personal demons in that way. We're both trying to help people to achieve a better life. But even remarkably more than that, my father got remarried. And even after many, many years of being with this woman, they adopted a young boy and raised him. I have a brother who's the same age as my middle daughter. I just got married in December. She has two children. My oldest daughter is 30 and my youngest child is now 14. I, I, I swear. I am just become my father over and over and over again. The problem that I had with my father was that he was from the older generation where it was the strong, silent type. Many times I wish that we had had more chances to talk. So the one change that I have made is that I talk much more to my children so that they won't have to say, God, I wish that I had had a chance to talk to my father more. If you have any chance at all to talk to people, do it. Doesn't matter what happened in the past, just go talk to them as often as you can before it's too late and they're not around to talk to you again. Thank you very much, Mr. Toastmaster.
Thank you, Michael, for that wonderful advice. It's, you never know what piece of advice, what thought you share sends that ripple in that pond, tossing a rock into a pond, the ripple goes on and on. And every time you, you may be quoted two generations from now because the things that you do today impact those around us and those around them. Our next speaker, speaker number eight, just one step in the legacy, just one step in the legacy, Dr. Michael Alexander. As Bob Anderson told us earlier, a father has a tremendous impact on their children. But I'm gonna tell you something about my dad, which is a little more dramatic. My father had a tremendous impact upon each and every one of you. You see, my father was the inventor of the barcode. So every soda can you drink, every tube of toothpaste you wash your mouth out with, every book you read was touched by my father's invention. But I'm not gonna talk to you about that tonight. You'll have to have me back another time or maybe I'll mention a little bit next, next month when I talk about a number of things. I wanna talk about my father and what he did specifically for me and my family. And more than just my father and the immediate family. When I was three years old, I knew what I wanted to be like when I grew up. I wanted to be just like my father. And at three years old, I set out to make that happen. I studied the way he walked. I listened and say the way he talked. I learned from him. I learned the way he thought, not just his politics. Oh no, because that wasn't important. I learned the way he thought about solving problems. I learned the way he approached a problem. And so as I grew up, I realized something very important. I could change who I am. I've heard people say, that's the way I am. I can't change it. Humbug. You can change it. I know. I spent my life becoming what I wanted to be. And I've changed myself when I didn't like what I'd become. So that was a great gift from my father. And I share it with you because I want you all to remember, you can change who you are. You can change who you become. But on my journey to become more like my father, I remember one day when my father said to me, Michael, there are some things that you will do because I do them and you like them. There were some things that you will do because I didn't do them. And there are some things you will not do because I did them and you didn't like them, and that's okay. My father gave me permission, however much I loved him, however much I wanted to be like him, to be something else. You see, when I was a young lad, like every young lad, I would occasionally reach into the refrigerator, take a drink, put the lid in, and put it right back in the refrigerator. Or maybe there was a cake, and I taste the frosting. And my father would say to me when he caught me, Michael, you know better than that. And I'd smile an impish smile and I'd say, but dad, you do it. And he'd smile right back at me and say, yes. But I like to think the breed improves. The breed improves. What an important message. The breed. My grandfather was an orphan. At eight years old, <clears throat> he was living on the streets of Atlanta. He worked his way down to Florida, to the sugar docks, where he learned Spanish and he learned the value of hard work. But he had a passion for civil rights. And that was a goal of his. He didn't just say, I have no education. He took a correspondence course 
in law. And in only a few months, my grandfather became admitted to the bar. And my grandfather was a civil rights lawyer in Selma, Alabama in the 30s. The family had crosses burned on their lawns. Sometimes they were fed in chickens. And so my grandmother developed a number of recipes for chicken. And sometimes racists left dead chickens on the lawn to protest a civil rights lawyer in Selma, Alabama. My grandmother cooked those too. This is the man who raised my father. A man who not only invented the barcode, but volunteered for charities whenever he could, helped, taught, and trained, raised myself and my two foster brothers, and always reminded me that the breed should improve. And so when my turn came to be a grown up, and I managed to prevent the building of a nuclear power plant, when I managed to get clean and efficient energy to the citizens of Minnesota, to change the way that gas was sold here, and yes, to bring down a major monopolist. I didn't say, I'm proud of myself. I said, no, I'm the next step in the legacy. That's my goal. When my son was born, a friend of mine asked me, so how has being my father changed you? And I said, the Lion King. When I first saw the Lion King, I wasn't a father. And I identified with Simba and said, what kind of a job am I doing carrying on the legacy of my father's? But after my son was born, I started to identify with Mustafa and said, what kind of a legacy am I leaving to my son? Because I can never forget the breed should improve. And I am just one step in the legacy. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, Michael. So much wisdom being shared and so much learning about each of us that are here in the room speaking. This will be a memorable night for sure, as far as I'm concerned. Our next speaker also belongs to a club of mine and is a significant other to who keeps our technology running. The speaker is Deanne Gunnerman. Speech title, Fine Line, Fine Line. Deanne Gunnerman. My father, George Shutt, equal parts inventor and instigator. He was bold, fearless, resourceful. They say there's a fine line between genius and insanity. I always said he had one foot on either side of that line. He was rarely raised by his parents, born in 1930, kind of shifted back and forth between the grandparents and working with the uncle on a farm much of his early years. But from the time he could read, he got popular mechanics and he would read it cover to cover as his extracurricular education. He spent years working on the farm, including not only operating the heavy equipment, even as a very young child, but also helping to you know, tinker with things and just kind of get his hands sturdy. There were even some of his te early teen years and even preteen years where he became responsible for taking care of his paternal grandfather as he, his health had failed. In junior high, near the end of World War II, he was already teaching woodshop to the other kids. When the teacher fell ill and there was a teacher shortage at that time, and so they asked him to teach the rest of the classes. So for part of a year, he became a teacher. His overall education, he finished in 10 and a half years as he skipped through 
a little faster. He had big dreams and aspirations, maybe something in management. So he started into a management trainee program at SS Kresge Variety Store. I believe they're the ones that later owned Kmart. Then he soon turned his attention to his dream girl that was working at the store. Now, of course, they weren't supposed to date coworkers, but he found out about Yvonne and he introduced himself by coming up with his box of Christmas cards that had his name custom printed on them. And he said, hello, Yvonne. Next year, these will have both of our names. She was a little taken aback. This is before stalkers were much of a thing, but he definitely was persistent. Her brothers finally met him and convinced her, maybe you should give this guy a shot. And you know what? The next year, it was both of their names, <laughs> Christmas cards. And at that point, several months after they got married, he got fired from that management training program because they found out he was fraternizing with a coworker. He'd already married her. That started his rebel phase, I think. He then turned his attention to getting into careers that would use his hands and his machining skills and so forth. And so he, you know, convinced my mom that he could just forge out, do different things. They were going to be just fine. Now, by the way, my mom was four hours older than my dad. I think it's about the only time she really had any kind of one up and saw on him. They were both born on February 18th, 1930. So he decided to get into machining, but he didn't actually have any experience unless you counted a little bit in wood shop. And I don't think that counted for much when it came to metal machining. So he lied like a dog. And first he got into an entry level position and then a journeyman spot became available. Now a journeyman is somebody with a vast amount of experience and knowledge and, and has gone through many steps. Well, apparently popular mechanics helped him to ace the interview and they had no clue that he did not have that level of experience. Six months in, there was a very simple term that any machinist, let alone a journeyman, should know. And they discovered he didn't have the background. They didn't fire him. Six months in, he had already done so many things that the other machinists said were impossible. In fact, they used to kind of make a, a game of, you know, hey, give it, give it to George. He won't know that it's really difficult to do what this customer wants. These customers don't know what they're talking about. And they'd come back. And it was done. It met the customer expectations just fine because his brain was totally unfettered. He didn't have come up in the confines and the education of what you did through the classic schooling method. His was reading, absorbing, observing, and trying things. And it worked. His early projects, X-15 test plane, Gemini space capsule reentry system, the S-71 spy plane many different projects, but he kind of got tired of always being put in a box. And, you know, if you put my dad in a box, somebody's going to get hurt and it's probably not going to be him. So he decided to go on his own. And because he was so accustomed to others getting the credit for his work because he was not a degree engineer, that's how his business model, he would get paid by companies and engineers that could not meet their customer expectation. He would do the work behind the scenes. They would get the credit. He would get the money. His first three months in business, he'd earned more than he had earned the prior year. So he was off and running. During that time, he became a full-time father because he worked at our house. So my brother and I really benefited from that far more you know, than our older two sisters. He never missed an event. He was always with us and just being part of our life. He became the inventor of the first arthroscopy tools for the microscopic knee surgeries through a counter. My brother say, telling the, the guy who knew about this doctor, hey, my dad can do that. And he goes, no, I'm, I'm serious. My dad can do that. Later in his life, he really got into being a rebel and fighting the 55 speed limit. He became the 
the hero to the truckers. He was constantly on the radio fighting against radar and the 55 speed limit. And at one point as a young adult, I was driving a car and I definitely did something illegal. And when they saw the shut medical name on the company car registration, the officer said, I do not need this kind of trouble. Don't do it again. No ticket. It was great. He was a simply unstoppable force. He loved to play. In his later life, he became a real beardy Santa. He just did it for free because it was fun. At his memorial, my nephew told a story that really summed up how he was. He's, my nephew said he felt like he was like the little dog running around the big dog and you know, what needs done? The, the tractor starter is not working. So my dad said, Cameron, go get that starter off. Cameron got the starter off, hands it to my dad. He goes in, he's looking on the computer trying to find out how much a new starter is. He comes back out and here's my dad with the old starter and a mousetrap. He took the little spring off the mousetrap, got it stuck on there. And 10 years later, Tractor still running, didn't even need a new starter. He just fixed it that way. Ever the clever one, he had a total of 13 patents to his name, 10 individually, three through companies. And he just, you know, basically taught us that we could be, do, or have anything we wanted if we just set our mind to it. And it was easy to believe because he was living proof. He lived his life to the fullest. He took full advantage of that fine line on both sides of it and had no regrets. Dad, thank you. Well, thank you, Deanne. <clears throat> Even though I've known you for quite a few years, <clears throat> I think I now know how you became who you are. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Kimberly Smith Austin giving the speech Still standing, still standing, Kimberly Smith Austin. I have fought a thousand battles and I'm still standing. I've cried a thousand tears and I'm still standing. I've been broken, betrayed and belittled. I've been given up on and rejected and I'm still standing. Toastmasters and my esteemed friends, my father, Dan Edgar Smith, still standing. Now it was December 11th or maybe December 12th, not sure. <laughs> In 1946, Dan Edgar Smith, AKA Debo was born in Quitman, Mississippi. Oh, I've heard the stories about this man. Now I say this man, but he was my dad. My aunt told me at my dad's memorial when he was four years old, just four, that he had learned where his mother worked and escaped from the family house and went downtown way, way far away and came back and told his siblings, I know where mom works. You guys, come with me. Come with me, they said. What do you mean? How did you get there? He said, I walked. You walked? Yes. Only discovered that that was mile upon mile upon mile. None of them wanted to take the journey, so they didn't. Dad got in trouble, but now he knew where mom was working. See, he was a man who believed that standing was important. He always said, if you don't stand for something, you will fall for everyone. My dad has taught me so many things. Now, I was a little teenager and I didn't think of it that way. But as I look back in my life now as a 50 <clears throat> something, I can see the stories, the truth, the revelations that I learned from dad. And today I want to share them with you. Dad was fun. Fun beyond fun. See, my dad served in the military. And I remember one time he had this green army jacket. It was cool beyond anything I had ever seen. I wanted it. And I thought if I wore it, my friends would thought, think I was cool. So I did. I said, dad, can I borrow your green jacket? It was 
screen like camouflage? He said, well, I don't know. He then started dancing and jumping all over and he fell to the ground and said, nah, I don't think so. You might get to your friend's house and have a party. And before I know it, no jacket for me. And I thought, this man is insane. <laughs> but it really was a reflection of who he is. Dad taught me as a young girl, I was the only child at the time. He took me fishing and showed me the beauty of just sitting and waiting. Now, not fun originally, but when you caught that big fish and reeled it in, the joy, the elation that happened and came over me, showed me that dad was fun. Then he showed me how to cut it, to clean it, and best of all, how to eat it. Dad would take me on these adventures and show me little ponds of water where we can go fishing and have some fun. Now, fun was definitely a highlight. And I'll tell you, that's a characteristic I carry with me today. But dad was also a fighter. <laughs> if he believed in something, there was nothing he wouldn't do to make sure you knew that he won the fight. He would talk and talk and talk until you were done. <laughs> You'd either give in and recognize that he won. Concede, my friends, concede. Now, if you believe in something, you stand for it. And that was his stand. See, he said, stand no matter what. Now, not only was he fun, but he was a fighter, but God, dad had faith beyond anything I had ever seen. As a young child, I remember at the ripening age of eight, dad told me a story about him going home to be with the Lord. And he was excited about it. Now, eight years old, I was not quite mature enough to understand that, but I can tell you, he was committed to it. And I was so excited the day he had the opportunity to be where he had talked about for over 40 years of my life. He had the faith of a mustard seed, friends. There was nothing he didn't believe he could do, nothing he couldn't have. And as a result of that, he lived his life that way. He told me everything is permissible, but not beneficial. Even though he knew that there was things that could be done, he didn't always do them for the good of faith, for the good of being an example to me. But the best thing I learned about dad was this value and this community and this connection with family. I'm a family girl. I didn't know it until I started having my own family, but I am the things, the times, the experiences. As an only child, I had lots of brothers and sisters, AKA cousins. My dad took me to every single cousin's house, some that were first, second, third, fourth, and fifth cousins. I had the opportunity to meet my expanded family. See, he was the youngest of five. He was the runt in the family, the troublemaker. Yes, his fun fighting nature. <laughs> caused him to get that title and that name, but there was nothing he cherished more than his family. And as a result, I have taken those principles with me. Family is everything. This man, the fighter, the fearless, the faithful man showed me so much and taught me so much. But what I love seeing is how faithful he was. Faithful to his beliefs, faithful to his family and faithful to my mother. I learned later in life that mom and dad divorced when I was only two. What? When I found that out, I was amazed. But my father never left. He never left our side. He never disappeared. My cousin said to me recently, your father never loved another woman. In fact, he spent the last 12 years, they spent the last 12 years together. Dad and mom were living life, sometimes good, sometimes not so much, but there was love, there was family, there was friendship. And I remember the day on August 8th at 5.55 a.m. when I got the call that dad was still standing. Literally, mom had gone to the bathroom 
And dad was standing at the sink and she's talking to him, having a conversation. And then she said his name and he did not respond. He's standing, but he was no longer present in his body. My father was a great man. A man that I cherish, a man that I love, a man that I model my life after. He's taught me so much and I'm so grateful for the legacy. I have fought a thousand battles and I'm still standing. I've cried a thousand tears and I'm still smiling. I've been broken, betrayed and belittled. I've been given up on and rejected, but I'm still standing. Back to you, Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, Kimberly. We keep learning over and over and over again about the value of fathers in our lives and the impact they have. I maybe can make the suggestion that if you know a young male who is married, who is a new father, you might suggest that they watch the video on YouTube of the speeches this evening and they will be changed their lives and the lives of their family and children. Our next speaker, some men never take credit. Randy Powell, Randy Powell, some men never take credit. I was about to, as I sit here listening to everyone, I was about to ask you to do something that I know you cannot do. And I thought that wouldn't be very fair of me to, to do that. So instead of doing that, what I'd like to do is just ask you to imagine the year is 1965. Now, I don't know where you were, but I was 11 years old. And I grew up in a small town in South Jersey. And the reason I ask you to imagine being 11 years old and growing up where you grew up is because when, when you're asked to reflect back, it's amazing how many things come to play and how you can connect the dots from back in time to where you are in your life now. In this little town I grew up in wasn't the best part of town. My mother had been divorced and I had a younger brother who was in diapers and an older brother, his name was Kenny. My younger brother's name is George. In 1965, The Sound of Music premiered. In fact, it bumped Gone with the Wind out of its first place spot. And as a little boy, James Bond played in Thunderball. And I wanted to be a secret agent man. And Lyndon B. Johnson, was our president. And Martin Luther King was doing his work to get Black registered to vote. And movie tickets were only a dollar. You could buy three gallons of gas with a dollar. I remember going down to the five and dime and taking our little lunch money. It only took 30 cents. And you seem to have candy all day long in school unless you got caught. For a dollar, you could buy 20 first class stamps and you could even get 21 ounce Hershey bars. And you know, Hershey, Pennsylvania wasn't that far from little Mount Holly, New Jersey, which was 20 miles outside of Philadelphia, not far from the Jersey coast. You could even with that same dollar, get a double decker burger. You could get some fries, a salad, and you could even get some ice cream. The troops were sent to Nam during that time and Gemini 3 was launched into orbit. And guess what? Even the great society was starting to come to play and, and the civil rights act was signed. This was an eventful time in our history. And so it's always been that as well. At 11 years old, growing up in a rough part of town, 
in the projects, we called it, with a younger brother and an older brother and no father there. It was just the way it was in my life. But I had an older brother who represented my best friend, and he was also like my dad, who was absent. He taught me some things, and he did the things that he could do that a big brother could do. We went fishing early in the morning. He gave me some hints about girls when I would ask, and we even talked. We really talked on the edge of the bed. You see, his bed was just across from mine. Small room. But we were happy and never fretted for anything. We had everything we ever needed. My mom worked two jobs. She never talked about my dad, that biological father. But one day, I was waiting for something from my brother. You see, my brother grew up and he went off to school and then he became one of the early digital computer engineers. And he was in New York City, he came to my eighth grade graduation. I was 14 years old and he promised me something. He had these really cool shoes and he said he would send me a pair and the pair never showed up. And my brother never ever failed to do something that he promised. And so I wondered what was going on and it just so happens that in the years between 11 and 14, I was 14 when I graduated eighth grade. In those years, my mother introduced us to this fine gentleman. He was smooth and debonair, and he was from Newark, New Jersey. Now, if you don't know anything about Newark, New Jersey, well, let me tell you something about Newark, New Jersey. At one point, and probably during that time, it was one of the roughest cities in the United States, probably even rougher than Chicago. He was the cool cat, but here's the thing. I didn't understand how he could be such a cool cat. His name was James A. Towns. His nickname was Stack. So we always called him Stack. We weren't allowed to call him James, of course. And he was a flight engineer with C-141 aircraft. And he came into our household and he treated us like gold. And so he became that father figure. And at 14 years old, the reason those shoes never showed up, my brother passed away from a brain hemorrhage in New York City. And the day I came home, Stack dragged me out to the back and he sat me in his 1967 T-Bird and he said, hey, Randy, got something to tell you, son. We're going to have a conversation. We're going to sit in this car and we're not getting out of the car for a while. And I didn't understand what he was saying at first. You know, this was the same flight engineer. This was the same gentleman. This was the same cool cat that taught my brother and I how to read a slide rule. If you don't know what a slide rule is, it is a supercomputer in the form of a ruler. This was the same guy who used to take us to the Jersey Shore almost every weekend, taught us how to eat clams out of the shell and throw some Tabasco sauce on there. This was the same guy who taught me about how to respect ladies and how to respect other people as well, no matter where they came from. And so he sat me in that car and he told me that my brother had passed away and he said, you're gonna have to become a man today. And I started crying because of course I didn't believe him that this had just happened. And we sat there and I don't know if we sat there for an hour or two hours, but when we got out of the car, he said, now you've got to go upstairs and be there for your mom. I slept with my mom on the floor that night as she whimpered and cried all night long. And the next day I realized I had to become the protector of my younger brother. And not too long ago, I had a conversation with Stack. He's passed away. And all the things that he taught me, I realized today he made me, or at least contributed a major part to who I am today. And so I pass this on to you because when I spoke to him last, Things were great. He was much older. But the second time I called him after many years, there was no answer. I never got to give him the verbal credit or say to him, thank you for everything you did. So when it comes to the pain, it's still there. But the gratefulness 
and the love for that gentle man carries on. And I've been able to share that and show my own sons how to be the person that they need to be for you, for others, just like you. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, Randy, for such a moving presentation. We are learning so much wonderful things about each other to know we appreciate each other a lot more after hearing these things about each individual person's story. One of the things you said was referring to back to what somebody had said way earlier, and I can't remember who it was that brought up, that you may be a father figure for someone just in your acquaintance, like you the Boy Scout leader or whatever it is, and this person that came into your life to serve as a substitute father for a time was so important. And we'll go on to our next speaker, and that's speaker number 12. Remembering my father, remembering my father, Richard Snyder. Have any of you ever wondered if your father loved you? Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, growing up, I wondered whether my father loved me. I remember asking my mother when I was 10 or 11, if my father loved me. And she said, yes, of course he does. I said, mom, I don't remember him ever telling me he loves me. Yes, son, his father was the same way or is the same way, your grandfather. But he spends a lot of time with you. He goes to your games. He watches sports, sporting events with you. He takes you to games. Some people say they love each other all the time and don't really mean it. A couple of years later in sixth grade, I was struggling. I was, I was not a very good student, maybe average. And I, we had a test coming up that Friday on European countries and capitals. It was a couple of days away and I don't think I knew half of them yet. My teacher and my mother struggled and I, I was so frustrated and I know my mother was. And at one point she finally just said, I, I give up. And she said, Richard, can you help your son? My father looked at the map and he did something that the teacher and my mother did not do. He said, Richard Ray, think of those countries as Dallas Cowboys. And I was a huge Dallas Cowboy fan at that time. The big countries are linemen. The smaller countries are receivers and running backs. We gave them names. Romania was Roger Staubach. Poland, I remember Poland, was Ed Polak, who was not a cowboy, but he went to the University of Iowa, where my father had gone to school. Friday came, and I aced the quiz, the test. In fact, I had the top score in the entire class. And I realized my father loved me. He was able to unlock what to me, for me, was all Greek to me. It had no meaning. They were just names. I had never been to Europe, but he was able to unlock what had no meaning for me by giving it meaning, by showing meaning, by tapping into something I did understand and loved at the time, football and the Dallas Cowboys. Years later, Thanksgiving time, Ryan's speech reminded me of this. Normally for Thanksgiving, we would spend time in Arizona with my mother. My, my parents had divorced many, many years. In fact, they divorced after 20 years of marriage, a very unhappy marriage. They were very different people. And it was a very difficult marriage. They always said they stayed together for the children. Bad, bad reason. They're, they're very poor reason. But my father after that was pretty much a recluse. We rarely saw him. And I remember in 2013, 
we decided to stay home. We had been to my mother's for many Thanksgivings and either that we'd rotate between my mother or my wife's family. And that year we decided to stay home. And I remember telling my wife, I'm going to call my father. I don't want him to be alone this Thanksgiving. Normally my father would have begged off and he said he didn't, wasn't driving at that point. I said, dad, get on the airplane, get on the bus, come see us. We, we don't want you to be alone for Thanksgiving. And for some reason he said, yes, he came for Thanksgiving and he, he actually stayed a week into December. And he stayed for my son's December 6th birthday. 10 days, almost two weeks. We had time to really talk as we had, hadn't talked for in years and years. But after my son's birthday, he said, it's, it's, it's time to go. I remember after, as I was dropping him off at the bus, something inside me said, I need to. I said, Dad, I love you. I hadn't told him that for years. I reached out my hand as we had always done to give him a handshake. And he put his arms out and gave me a hug. One of the few hugs I can remember from him. And he whispered in my ear, I'm proud of you, Richard Ray. And I love you. Tears were streaming down my, my face. He said, I hope to see you and your brothers in Arizona for Christmas. I said, Dad, please, please do. Mom, Mom would be happy to see you too. Well, Christmas came and I got the inevitable call. He didn't show up. He didn't want to make waves with the family, especially my mother. I remember talking to him and said, Dad, I, I really appreciate your coming for Thanksgiving. I'll see you in summer. We're going to come up to Vegas to see you. I got a call in late March, early April. Are you the son of Richard Ray Snyder? I said, yes. Your father died I, I thank God I took the time to call my father and spend two of weeks with him Thanksgiving so he wasn't alone but he died alone his body wasn't discovered for almost a week it, it's sad but I thank God that I reached out to him and we had that time together. So whatever your relationship is with your father, parents, brothers, take that time out because you never know how long they're going to be. I'm so happy I took time to that time for my father and to tell him I love him and finally hear from him. I love you, son. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, Richard, for those suggestions. Many of us needed that suggestion a while back. And uh, with those of us who can do that, even with others, not necessarily a father can still do that. Make sure you always make those connections that you can. And thank you for that moving presentation. The next person is probably the only person in the room where I actually knew their father, because our next speaker is Connie Jameson, special dad, Special Dad, Connie James. Fred Rutherford Stevens Jr., my special dad, was not a part of my life until I was about age four. You see, Fred was not my birth father, but after he married my mom, he adopted me and went on to father six additional children, my siblings. I was never treated any differently than my siblings. In fact, I think I was into my teens before I even realized I had a different father. 
than they had. I was always just the oldest of us seven Stevens children, Connie, Judy, Vicki, Jackie, Fred, Jill, and Rodney. I've come to realize what a special gift this was from my dad, my special dad. After my mom died, I was then in my mid thirties, my dad asked me if I would like to try to meet my birth dad, Clifford Luxton. I agreed. So my dad worked to get me in touch with an aunt and uncle who would be able to contact Mr. Luxton. Well, my birth dad never responded to meeting me and well, that's okay. It would have been interesting, but I knew, I had no doubt that Fred Stevens would always be my real dad, my special dad. I want to share another reason why Fred Stevens is a special dad. Fred Rutherford Stevens Jr. Wow, sounds rather impressive. Is it his educational achievements? No, Fred only completed to the eighth grade. Oh, well, was it his community involvement? No, Fred didn't join any community organizations or clubs and never took a leadership role in our little community. Oh, well, perhaps it was his impressive career or occupational record. No, well, many people would say no. Fred worked for most of his life for the Boone County Highway Department in Northern Illinois. He operated a road grader, building roads and repairing roads, and a snow plow to clear the roads in the winter. So I would say his job was definitely important, if not necessarily impressive to some. I still recall worrying about my father when a big snowstorm was forecast because I knew he would be receiving that phone call in the middle of the night and he need to get out of bed to go and clear the snow from the roads for many hours while others were in bed sleeping on that chilly evening. No, my dad is not special for job titles, educational degrees, or club memberships. He was simply a family man, always there for the welfare of his wife and seven children. Working for that paycheck, home for family dinner every night, Friday night grocery shopping, taking his family for the Sunday drive, in the old station wagon and stopping on the way home for a and root beer. My dad also had a little garden, a garden that provided food for the family and the opportunity for we Stevens kids to pull our little red wagon around filled with sweet corn, tomatoes and muskmelon, also known as cantaloupe to many. We would be able to pull it around the neighborhood to sell it, make some money. Yes, life for my dad was pretty common, routine, ordinary, but also important, special, because Fred Stevens provided his family a childhood home where we felt safe, secure and loved. I believe if all children could be provided that safety, security and love, what a better world this would be. And that's why my dad, Fred Stevens and all those others, just regular old family man, dads, those out there, should be recognized for the special dads that they truly are. Mr. Toastmaster. 
Well, thank you, Connie, for that. I know your dad, and he was a special guy. And uh, we appreciate your sharing those thoughts. Speaker number 14, best ever, Michael Osher. Michael Osher, best ever. My father, Richard Osher, known as Dick, married my mom in his senior year at Syracuse University in New York. Two months after graduation, he joined the Army, Corporal Osher. But he owes me big time. We have pictures of my mom on the ship back from Germany to New York, nine and a half, pregnant, nine and a half months pregnant with me in June of 1955. He owes me because the Army took pity on him, discharged him honorably two months early so he could be there for my birth. That was the one and only time he ever waited for me. And I wasn't even late. Thinking about my father who died in February of this year, dedication. He was a football, basketball, baseball player. My freshman year of high school, I played defense on the, the freshman soccer team. He hated soccer. He didn't understand what offsides meant, for those of you who play soccer. But he came to every single game. I'm not sure he understood it. But he was dedicated, and he needed to know that we felt loved and that he came to all those games anyway. Wow. Tolerance. My father was an entrepreneur. He was a Republican. You can imagine how he voted. In high school, I was a long-haired. I had long hair. I had hair. I was a long-haired hippie, ultra-left-wing liberal. Oh, when it came to politics, it was pretty dramatic. We couldn't agree on anything. And when I went to Trinity College in Hartford, I majored in philosophy. And he didn't get mad at me. I think he's still waiting for me to open that philosophy store. Or find a paying job then. Oh, I can't imagine. Luckily, I did my master's in business, so I may have recovered from that one. He was set in his ways. He had a famous saying, or infamous saying, being late is a planned event. Sounds like Toastmasters. He had the five-minute rule, but it was a little different than what we did. If we were going skiing, the car left at 8.30. His five-minute rule meant you had to be in the car ready to go at 825 because at 830, he was moving out the driveway. Good luck getting to the mountain skiing. And where I grew up, it was a 45-minute drive to the mountains. Now, if you missed that ride, here's the good part. He was generous to a fault. One o'clock, you met on the mountain for lunch. Well, I mean, 1255. And if you were there, he bought you lunch. Can you imagine what lunch costs on the mountain in Colorado? I didn't have that kind of money. You bet I was there at 1255. I didn't want to miss that lunch. Because well, if you had to get a ride and then you miss lunch, your day was not going well. He had a saying, though, a family that skis together stays together and family vacations were paramount to him. We always went on family vacations, whether it was cross country, going across the country, wherever we went, it was a family together so that we would stay together. There was never any confusion about any of that. He was wise. Even, even as a long haired hippie philosophy major, he knew that I would have self-respect once I got a job. His philosophy, working cures all ills. He still gave, until he died, he gave advice to my brother about his business side. And he always had that, what, that wisdom to give us good guidance. Whether it was buying a home, income property, or never getting attached to real estate. 
when a house, when he was done with something, whether it was investment or whether it was a house, he was done. There was no crying. Even to this day, he sold a cottage on a lake in upstate New York that nobody could afford now. We never forgave him. And he would just say, we're not talking about it anymore. So that's a smart man. That's how you thrive in real estate. He was relentlessly positive. His favorite book, some of you may know this, Norman Vincent Peale's The Power of Positive Thinking. That was his Bible. He made me read it all the time. And then he would say, this is the best ever, whether it was pizza, whether it was blueberry pancakes, whether it was a day together, it was always the best ever. That book. Um, I read it, but did I take it to heart in time? Over time, I did. But if you always see the positive side, it's amazing how things can happen for the positive. <sighs> My last conversation with him the week before he died, I was giving him a hard time about being old. I said, can you believe you're old enough to have a son that retired from a government job? Oh, that really got him. So we had a good laugh about that. Thinking about this dedicated, tolerance, stubborn, full of love, and relentlessly positive. That was my father. In closing, I found a poem from a World War II Canadian pilot, John McGee. I'll give you three lines from it. He has slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter silvered wings. He has put out his hand and touched the face of God. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, Michael. Your story, about, and my daughter is in the audience. Your story about being him going to your soccer games when he couldn't stand soccer reminds me of all those ballet rehearsals I went to with my daughter. So she'll probably smile at that if she is in the audience yet. yet. <sighs> well, I kept talking all this time. Hopefully we wouldn't have time to have me as I am the last speaker. And I'm, I am only going to do it because of my father's boring into me. If you say you're gonna do something, by golly, you do it. So that's where we're going. Our next speaker is me. And the title is, You Were There. My father was born in 1903. I think I beat you all, 1903. Anyway, he grew up in a very poor, in Chicago, a very poor, large family with seven brothers and sisters and a very ill mother and a father who had a problem with alcohol, my grandfather. His father also had a problem with change. I guess that's where I get it. He was an original Teamster when Teamsters were driving horses and carriages or horses and and freight trucks. But when they moved to trucks, he refused to change and never worked another day in his life. Not a quality that my father learned because my father was the exact opposite in those terms because I can honestly say I never ever even heard of an opportunity where he had a chance to work, had a chance to put in overtime, had a chance to do a separate job on the weekends when he turned it down. I don't think he ever turned down the opportunity to work more and earn more money for his family, not for his fun hobbies. And you know, he, his hobby was to buy a tractor and go road and tell the neighbor's yards. So he was not doing it for his own personal toy benefit, but because that's what he, he believed. I think that might've come from, he went through the depression as a young adult. He used to talk about one year he went every single day of the year out looking for a job and he looked from door, morning to night without finding any success. He was the older brother. And remember, father, well, his father wasn't very responsible, so he felt a responsibility to the family. But he, like I said, he never turned down an opportunity to work. I learned that from him. I think at 12, I was a caddy at the nearby golf course, working my way through various jobs. I worked 20 to 25 hours a week during the school year when maybe I should have been studying, but I was working at 20 to 25 hours a week because 
believe it or not, my parents allowed me to keep half of every dollar I made and set aside the rest of it for college. I wasn't too happy about that, but I, that's what encouraged me to work more and be more responsible. By the time I graduated from high school, at one point I had a job for at least a couple of years where I averaged 66 hours a week working because I never turned down the opportunity to work overtime. My father was a tough, strong, hard man. I don't think I ever saw him admit to pain. I never saw him cry or feel depressed about anything. And he would just put up with it and take care of it and do, do the business that he had to do. He was uh, strong. He was so strong that, well, one of the jobs he had during the Depression was tearing apart automobiles with a sledgehammer. Uh, the nowadays, they just crush them up. So strong that at the time he was in his 80s, his grip was stronger than mine ever was in my life. And I was a weightlifter for a number of years. He was uneducated, but that doesn't mean that he was unintelligent. He only went to the third grade in person, he did some night school, got some training in electronics and became a wizard at electronics. He uh, used to claim he thought he had invented the clock radio because he had one before there was such a thing. He built our television from pieces, not from a kit, from pieces. He made our first television with that. I once saw him light up a light bulb in his hand with no wires. I had to convince me how that was done, but he did it. Pretty fun and pretty special. When I decided to go off to, to college, oh, when I wanted to buy a car, he said, yeah, sure, go ahead. Want to buy a car, go ahead. When you get the money and the money for insurance, you can have a car. No more driving the family car for me. That If you wanted it, you had to earn it. On the other hand, he gave me that level of responsibility. Once I had done my chores, once I had done the things that needed to be done, I had more freedom than the typical other child. I could ride my bicycle at 12 or 14, 20, 15, 20 miles into town, and there was no complaint about whether I was responsible enough to do that. They expected me to do it. In seventh grade, I got a 22 caliber rifle. In the eighth grade, a 12 gauge shotgun. Went off hunting rabbits and so on in the rural neighborhood where we were. And so I had, was given that responsibility. Probably hardly ever had a curfew. But I better not get into trouble. I mean, I definitely, and I followed that up with my daughter too. You get in trouble, I may come out and bail you out on Monday, but you better stay out of trouble this weekend because I'm not going to be available to get you out of it. I'm going to make sure you stay out of it in the first place. I learned a lot of responsibility. But it was tough. I had very negative feelings about my father. As I said, my people have said in the past, never get, was told, I love you. Never heard anything positive, only criticism and suggestions where you might improve. And, but he was there. He was there to help me, show me how to fix my car when there was something wrong, not to fix it for me and not to do it for me, but show me. He was there to help me ride a bicycle, except that he gave me a, a large, large bicycle, but refused to allow me to try training wheels. And so that made me put it off for a while. He provided so many chores for me during the summer because he didn't want me to be useless that I couldn't possibly finish them before noon every day in the summer during quote, summer vacation. But I also learned to do a lot of things. I learned to take care of the things that I needed to take care of and do the things I needed to do and fix my own equipment and and that was, that was pretty impressive. Now, I don't want this to sound as a negative thing, but even though, even in high school, I remember, believe it or not, conjuring, how could I fantasize? How could I do him in and get away with it? Because we had such a poor relationship. But I'm not here to give a negative speech about him because I'm actually here to thank him. And thank him for being there. When I see, as in Bob Anderson's presentation, the negative impacts of not having your father there as responsible. Even my mother as a nurse, who would have lived in a little apartment in the city of Chicago with all kinds of negative temptations, instead of living in a, our own house out in a rural area where I could 
walk in the woods and do all kinds of things like that and have that response that responsibility of doing things. I remember I didn't go to college right away. And when I went to college and struggled to make sure I got through it with much help from my wife and others, that when I graduated, probably the most hurtful thing he ever said to me was all that education, you can tell he didn't have much himself, all that education and all you're gonna do is teach with a disdain and he probably expected me to have some kind of fancy office with my education, but he was there. Without him being there, I would not have had the opportunity to do the things that I did. Without him being there, my life would have been so significantly different. And he allowed me to have a life that I have and I do appreciate it. And at this point, it's a good time for me to make a public acknowledgement. Thank you, Dad. I know we always had a hard time communicating, but thank you, Dad, for being there. And I know I, I really appreciate that and I love you. Now, that's the end of my speech, but I do want to say, I think there's many out there, <clears throat> fathers, maybe you all looking down at us and glad for this evening. And I certainly am glad for this evening too. With that, I think we are close to time being out of time, but we do have time for an announcement. Oh, by the way, next month, Speakers Bureau, I expect to have two queues, people going for their QSs. We may have room for a presentation. Seems to me one of you in the audience mentioned you might have an opportunity to present uh, at our next opportunity, which will be in July. We have room for probably once other, one of our qualified speakers to do a speech. We'll have two people, I think, going for their qualified speaker. And uh, with that, I think I'm going to ask Michael to be the boss that he could take on some of that responsibility of being co-chair. And, and with that, we will pass the responsibility to talk about announcements back to our district leader, temporarily at least, until a few more days go by, Suzanne Leonard. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, for this hosting this beautiful e evening and my fellow Toastmasters and colleagues for opening your hearts to your stories about dads. Yeah, my Al Thomas, my dad was such a collection of all the stories you have. However, on this Father's Day, you'll have an opportunity to join your division and area teams at the Juneteenth celebration in Redlands at Sylvan Park, right across from the university. We'll have a booth there and we have time slots. You hopefully saw it in the D12 news. Make sure you find out about it. It's also posted on the website, the D12 news that has the information. So from 8 a.m. in the morning till 8 p.m. in the evening, your Toastmaster family is there and areas and divisions will be represented. They'll be bringing the ribbons and awards that they have won, some information on the three clubs that we hope to charter this month, our wonderful entrepreneurial club, which is for the early risers. I see Ray in the audience and some others. The Parliamentarian Club, which is so important, especially if you're a club officer and club president. And of course, our Advanced Pathways Program that helps the leaders in the Pathways Program, all the VPEs, hone their skills to serve the district. So Juneteenth, Father's Day, come and join your Toastmaster family there. June is full of other wonderful activities, celebrating District 12, our TLI with our installation and our new area and director, excuse me, teams. And you're right, Tom, the clock is ticking. It is the beat the clock time, of course, in our awards part of the year. And I have 30 days to have the privilege of being your District 12 director. Thank you for the opportunity. Unmute, Tom. I was going to say, I'm not going to say that again. Now I have to say nice things about Suzanne twice. No, you've done an outstanding job, I think one of the best we've had. So I'm so appreciative. It's not, I'm not gonna worry about whether we're distinguished or presidents or smedleys or anything else. The job to do it is the best job you can. And you did a wonderful job. I'm really proud of your, <clears throat> of your work this year. <clears throat> I do wanna leave with one word or a few words of our present presenters. When I got this idea about doing a theme meeting and Michael agreed and thought it was a good idea, of having a theme on 
about mothers for May and fathers for June, I could not have imagined how well it went and how important these messages are. I am so happy and want to thank each and every one of you for your heartfelt heart you put into your speeches and the thoughts and ideas. So thank you again for that. And uh, I can't think of anything else. If anybody has anything to say in response to that, but we will see you all at the next Speakers Bureau meeting in July. See you. Thanks again. Thank you.